Okay, we, so we start chapter 8 today, and chapter 8 is a lot of series and sequences, and then we lead into probability. So this is, uh, this is another big chapter on standardized tests, especially when we get to the probability, which is at the end. Um, we start with series and sequences, and sequences being any kind of sequences, and then we narrow it down in the next section to arith arithmetic, and then one further geometric, and then we'll pause for a quiz on 818283, okay? And then we'll finish off the chapter for your test, which will be the first test of the fourth quarter. So we define a sequence first, and a sequence is defined as, well, an infinite sequence is defined as a function whose domain is the set of all positive, num of positive integers. The function values are read as like a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3. Those are the numbers in the sequence are called the terms of the sequence. So the first one is a1, the second one is a2, the third one is a3, and so on and so forth. So you won't see negative numbers on the bottom, okay? It won't be like a negative 1. It always starts with a sub 1. Sometimes you'll see a sub 0 when we get later on, but for now we're starting with a sub 1. If the domain of a function consists of the first n positive integers only, then the sequence is a finite sequence. So if I say something like, give me the first three terms in the sequence, that's finite because it's, it's got a beginning and it's got an end. If I said when we get to it, you'll see like a little infinity symbol, obviously that's going to be an infinite sequence because there's no end to it. Okay, so the first example is just write the first four terms. In the sequence, uh, assume that n begins with 1. So like I said, unless we're told otherwise, we're going to assume n begins with 1. So if I look at that first one, I just want to find when a, a sub 1, which means n is 1. Then I want to find a sub 2, which means n is 2. Then I want to find a sub 3, which means n is 3. And a sub 4, which means n is 4. So this would be 2 minus 4, which is negative 2. This would be 4 minus 4, which is 0. 6 minus 4, which is 2. And 8 minus 4, which is 4. So when I list them, and I'll list them in order of a sub n, I mean a sub 1 up to a sub 4, it's a series of negative 2, 0, 2, and 4. That's how you will write your answer. So the first four terms in that sequence. Easy stuff, right? Just plug in numbers in. So if I do it with B, A sub 1 is 2 times 1 over 1 plus 1. A sub 2 is 2 times 2 over 2 plus 1. A 3, 2 times 3 over 3 plus 1. And A 4... 2 times 4, 4 plus 1. So here I get 2 over 2, which is 1. Here I get 4 over 3, which stays that way. 6 over 4, which becomes 3 over 2. And 8 over 5, which would stay that way. So the terms in this sequence would be 1, 4 thirds, 3 halves, and 8 fifths. So sometimes there will be a pattern to these numbers that are easy and obvious, and sometimes it's a little bit more intricate. That's why you'll just plug numbers in. You're not going to find the pattern just yet. Questions on that one? So WebAssign will ask you to list them, and you'll do it just like that. Okay, don't rearrange them in order from smallest to largest because sometimes that doesn't go in the order of the sequence. Sometimes we're working backwards. Sometimes the numbers are getting smaller than bigger. Like B, it's 1, and then 1 and 1 third, 1 and 1 half, right? So it's different. Sometimes they're getting bigger, sometimes they're getting smaller. You want to put them in the order in which you got them. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, that's, thank you. This is two, this is three.
Okay, first five terms in the sequence should have been negative one-half, two-thirds, negative three-fourths, four-fifths, and negative five-sixths. So one of the reasons why I picked this example is that you can start to see how you could change a sign from positive to negative, negative to positive. Because in a little bit, we're going to have to try to figure out a pattern and figure out how to write a pattern in an expression form. So things like negative 1 to an nth power would change, being multiplied by something, is going to change the signs, right? And then realize that you can separate it out a numerator and a denominator. So sometimes you're doing something with n in the top. Sometimes the numerator is always the same, and you could keep it just like one over something, but sometimes you're changing both. So you can have multiple n's in your statement because you might need it done in different ways. All right, this one just says find the indicated term in the sequence. So instead of finding all four of them and then going to the last one, we just want a sub 4. So we just want where n is 4. So I would do 4 squared over 2 times 4 plus 1, 16 over 8 plus 1, 16 over 9. So I could give you a sub 27, and you would plug in 27. Okay, just keep in mind that it's, you're, you're skipping directly to that one. Still good? And there's no need to convert these into mixed number. You'll write the fraction, just make sure it's simplified. Okay, now the directions say write an expression for the apparent nth term of the sequence and assume n begins with 1. So here we've got the first five terms in a sequence. We have to figure out the pattern. Now here's the difference between what you're used to in terms of patterns and what we're going to do now. Usually you say, okay, what gets me from 0 to 3 and 3 to 8 and 8 to 15 and 15 to 24, right? You're trying to figure out that pattern. Like that's how we do geometric patterns in, in geometry, that kind of stuff. What we're doing with these, these are sequences. So it's a little bit like a pattern, but it's a sequence, which means I'm trying to figure out if A is 1, if N is 1, then my answer is 0. If n is 2, then my answer is 3. If n is 3, then my answer is 8. If n is 4, then my answer is 15. If n is 5, then my answer is 24. So I'm trying to find a relationship between the n, the number of term, and the solution so that they would all be the same, but not from going from one term to the next. So not from 0 to 3, or 3 to 8, or 8 to 15, or, 8, or 15 to 25. So the first thing I would say is never just stick with the first two terms. Like don't look at zero to three and try to figure out based on that. Look at all your terms. So one of the things I would say is there's a big jump, there's a small jump in the beginning and a big jump at the end. Like from 15 to 24, that's a jump of nine. And the beginning we're only jumping three. So this can't be something that we're adding or subtracting, right? Because it's a bigger jump. So what do you see here? What's the kind of a, a relationship between left side and right side? Anybody see it? The numbers are getting squared, but then subtracting one. subtracting one. So let's see if that works. If I take whatever the number is, square it, and subtract one, for the first one, I'd get one minus one, which is zero, and that works. Two squared minus one, that's four minus one, that's three, that works. Three squared is nine, nine minus one is eight, that works. Four squared, 16 minus one is 15, that works. And five squared uh, minus one is 24. So that works, right? So our pattern is n was squared, right? And then we subtracted 1. So a sub n would equal n squared minus 1. I think that's the only one that works for this one. That's not always the case. Sometimes there's more than one way to do it, OK? You could have done n times n, but it'd still be n squared. I guess you could have technically done n plus 1 and n minus 1 and then the product of them, because you could factor that, right? So there's more than one way to do a couple of these. Doesn't mean it's wrong. All right, now let's look at B. So what's happening is that if n is 1, it's 2 thirds. If n is 2, it's 3 fourths. If n is 3, it's 4 fifths. If n is 4, it's 5 sixths. If n is 5, it's 6 sevenths. What do we notice about a pattern from left to right here? God bless you. Good. So in the top, I'm going n plus 1. Yes. And in the bottom, I'm going n plus 2. 1 plus 1 is 2. 1 plus 2 is 3. 2 plus 1 is 3. 2 plus 2 is 4. And so on and so forth. So in my numerator, it's n plus 1. And in my denominator, it's n plus 2.
Questions? Okay, sometimes there's going to be some guess and check. So don't stress out if it's not the first thing you figure out, okay? And again, sometimes there's more than one answer. All right, now we're going to talk about a recursive sequence. So a recursive sequence is one in which is impacted by the number that comes before it. So a recursive sequence is one that relies on the value of the pre for previous term. To define a sequence recursively, you need to be given one or more of the first few terms. So you will get given one term, and then that term gets you to the next. So you will see most of the time here, not all the time, but you will see that A sub 1 is given, and then you're going to find the next couple of terms. But it's all based on the first one. So the notation is confusing here, if you don't know what you're looking at. This says K plus 1, and this says K. So the one on the left is one more than the one on the right, okay? If we actually put values in here, we're saying that A sub N would be A sub, well, let me do a number actually. So if I said A sub two would equal A sub one plus 10. So the one on the left is always gonna be one more than the one on the right because we need the one before it to get that answer. So if I was looking at this recursive one, I would say if A sub two is A sub one plus 10, then that means this is five plus 10, which is 15. And a sub 3 would be a sub 2 plus 10, which is 15 plus 10, or 25. So in these, we are always building from the one that comes before it. So you need at least one to go on. I can't give you none here, okay? You have to have at least one to start with. So recursive will say n plus 1 or k plus 1 in that little subscript. It would look something like this. Write the first five terms of the sequence defined, and again it says recursively, which means it relies on the one that comes before it. So if a sub 1 is 15, and a k plus 1 equals a k plus 3, then a sub 2 equals a 1 plus three and a three equals a two plus three and a four equals a three plus three and a five equals a four plus three so to each of these you're adding three this would be 15 plus three which is 18 18 plus three 21 21 plus three 24 24 plus 3, 27. Now the directions say, write the first five terms. You have to include the one they gave you, and that's the biggest mistake people make on this kind of question. The one they gave you is a sub 1. So 15 comes first, then 18, then 21, then 24, then 27. Those would be the first five terms of your recursive sequence. Again, biggest mistake people make here is skipping that first one and going to one more, like going from 18 to 30. Those would not be the first five terms. That would be term two to six. Yep. This is what they gave you this, right? So this number is one more than this number. So whatever that term is, if I wanted to go to A sub five, then it would be a sub 4 plus 3. Yep. Recursive means the one after it needs the one before it. So it always takes the one before. Other questions on that one? Okay. Example 6 says write the first five terms of the sequence defined recursively. Then use the pattern to write the nth term of a sequence as a function of n. So you do the first one, first step, right? So first five terms of the sequence defined recursively, do that. And then we'll try to work on that pattern.
All right, so the first part was to find the first five terms. First term's 81, then we do a third of 81, I get 27. A third of 27, I get nine. A third of nine, I get three. And a third of three, and I get one. Questions on that part? All right, so once you get that, then the second part of this question says, use the pattern to write the nth term of the sequence as a function of n. This is saying, figure out the expression for n, but not recursively. So they gave it to you recursively. We gotta figure out how I could do this without it being recursive. So one, and a sub one would be 81, two, 27, three, nine, four, three, and five, one. How do I do this? What's the relationship between one and 81, two and 27, three and nine, four and three, and five and one? There's a cute, well, I mean, you could do a cube for 81 and 27. Yeah. But how else could I do that? So there's some sort of a power happening here. Yeah. So like if 3 to the 4th is 81, 3 to the 3rd is 27, 3 to the 2nd is 9, 3 to the 1st is, or sorry, 3 to the 1st, God bless you is three and three to the zero is one. How do I get that in terms of one, two, three, four, and five? What does that look like? I can't say n plus three, right? Because if I did n plus three, one plus three is four. But if I did n plus three here, that's n to the fifth. So I can't do it that way. I can't add. What else might I be able to do? Okay, so how do I get from one to four subtracting? I could do five minus one, and that's gonna give me four. Five minus two, that's gonna give me three. Five minus three, that's gonna give me two. Five minus four, that's gonna give me one. Five minus five, that's gonna give me zero. So I can try three and five minus n. So if I say a sub n equals three, five minus n, then I can do, if n is one, then it would be three, five minus one, that's three to the fourth, that's 80, 81. If it's two, three, five minus two, that's three to the third, that's 27. Three, three, five minus three, that's three to the second, that's nine, three, or sorry, four. Five minus four, that's three to the first, that's three. And five, three, five minus five, that's three to the zero, which is one. So that works, right? I've also seen it done with the one third and an n minus five, so the other way around. If you do one third n minus five, I'd get one third to the one minus five, which is one third negative four, which becomes 81. And then one third, two minus five is one third to the negative three, which is 27. So both of these work. Realize that there's not always gonna be just one answer, okay? Both of those can work. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sometimes it's gonna be easy, you're gonna figure it out. Sometimes you're gonna have to try a couple of different things. All right, factorial notation. So there's a little thing on your calculator that has an exclamation mark, if you've ever seen it and you haven't used it in a long time, okay? This is called a factorial. And a factorial is that number times itself. You went to student services, right? Is that what the scribble on the bottom was? Thank you. The factorial is, it, is that number multiplied by, like, so if it's 10 factorial, it's 10, then 9, then 8, then 7, then 6, then 5, then 4, then 3, then 2, then 1, all the way down until you hit 1. So if I have five with an exclamation mark, that's not like five. That's five factorial, which means it's five times four times three times two times one, okay? 
So I'd multiply, this would be 20, 20 times three is 60, 60 times two is 120, and 120 times one would be 120. So you're gonna see these with numbers and then you're gonna see these in terms of like an N, which I'll talk about. One of the special cases, and there's no way to figure it out if you didn't have your calculator, there's no way I can multiply zero times something like less than one. It would just be one. So it, it kind of has something to do with the power. Like if you think about something to the power of zero is one, zero factorial is one, okay? And again, there's no way to like compute that. That's straight memorization. You have to know that, okay? All right, so this says write the first five terms of the sequence, and this is a factorial. So I have one over n minus one factorial. So I'm gonna do a sub one, a sub two, a sub three, a sub four, a sub five. This is one over one plus one factorial, one over two plus one factorial, one over three plus one factorial, one over four plus one factorial, and one over five plus one factorial. So this becomes one over two factorial, which is one over two times one, or one half. This is one over three factorial, which is one over three times two times one, or one six. One over four factorial, which is one over four times three times two times one, which is one twenty-fourth. So I'm just multiplying the, the, the biggest number times the one before it, because I already did all that other work. One over five factorial. One over five times four times three times two times one. We know four times three times two times one, 24. So I just want to do 24 times five. One over 120. And the last one, one over six factorial. One over six times five times four times three times two times one which is 120 times six, or one over 720. So the first five terms of the sequence would be one half, one sixth, one twenty fourth, one one twentieth, and one seven twentieth. Again, I want it in that order, not in order from sm uh, smallest to largest. You want it in the order you got it. Example eight says simplify the factorial expression. So the first one says five factorial times seven factorial. So here's one option. Write out five times four times three times two times one over seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. And multiply out my numerator, multiply out my denominator. It's gonna be a lot of work I don't need to do. What I can do is they both have a one, they both have a two, they both have a three, they both have a four, they both have a five. So I can just make this one over 42, or one over seven times six. Does that make sense? The shorter way to do it is look at the five and the seven, pick the smaller one. What's smaller, five factorial or seven factorial? Five, leave it how it is, and then take the bigger one and break it down until you hit the smaller one. So this would be seven times six times five factorial. Then I can cancel the five factorials and I just get one over 42. Don't go through the work of five times four times three times two times one and then seven times six, like that's nonsense. You don't do it. Take the bigger one, break it down until you hit the smaller one and stop. Does that make sense? Okay. So now look at B, we don't even have values in B. N plus two factorial over N factorial. But which one's bigger? n plus 2 factorial, right? So if it's n plus 2 factorial, it'd be n plus 2 times what's 1 less than that? n plus 1 factorial. What's 1 less than that? n factorial over n factorial, right? We broke the top one down until it was, hits the smaller one. These cancel, and my answer would be n plus 2 times n plus 1, which I would take or you could foil it out, n squared plus 3n plus 2. So either answer works for me. If it's multiple choice, obviously one of those will be there, not the other. So 
still with me? Well, I feel like section ones are lots of slides, right? Because we're laying the foundation. Section is summation. So this is that little funky E, which is read as sigma. Again, that's some college prep for you. Okay, fraternities love sigma, sororities love sigma. Now I just taught you something that's very valuable when you get to college, okay? The little e is called sigma, and it is a sum. The way the summation works is it starts with the term that's in the bottom, and it stops at the term that's at the top. So the lower limit is the start place, which is on the bottom. The upper limit is the stop. So if I told you to find the summation where i equals 1 and n is 3, that means I'm going to find a sub 1, a sub 2, and a sub 3, and then I'm going to add them all together. And obviously there will be an expression here for what a is. If it said 3 in the top but 2 in the bottom, then I am finding a sub 2 and a sub 3 and adding them together. So this is not the number of terms. That's your upper bound. That's when you stop. Okay, it doesn't mean there's three terms. It means I'm going from the number at the bottom to the number at the top. Does that make sense? It's the most mis common mistake people make. So if the number at the bottom is one, then you will have the same number of terms as you have on the top number. But the number at the bottom is not one, you're gonna have a different number of terms. So example nine says find the sum. What's the bottom number? Zero. What's the top number? How many terms am I going to have that I have to add up? Four. One more, right? Because now I'm starting at zero. So I'm going to find a sub zero. I'm going to find a sub one, a sub two, and a sub three. And then at the end, I'm going to find the sum, add them all up. So this is zero plus one times zero minus two. One plus one times one minus two. 2 plus 1 times 2 minus 2, 3 plus 1 times 3 minus 2. So I get 1 times negative 2, negative 2. 2 times negative 1, negative 2. 3 times 0, 0. 4 times 1, 4. with me so far. Now I've got to add them all up. So my answer for summation is going to be negative 2 plus negative 2 plus 0 plus 4. This is negative 4 plus 4. And my summation is actually 0. Your summation can be negative. It can be 0. It can be positive. There's no rule on what kind of summation it is because if you have more negative numbers than you have positive, it could be negative. Okay? But the answer to this is actually 0. Now I'm going to show you how to do it in your graphing calculator. You obviously will not have your graphing calculator on this test or quiz. Okay. Most likely you will actually only have a four function calculator because the scientific ones are so different. Some have the summation, some don't. But I'm going to show you how to do this so you can check your answers, especially on your homework. And should you see this stuff on standardized tests, you can use your calculator. Most calculators have some sort of summation. You just got to find it. Most calculators minus the four function have the, the exclamation, the factorial. You just got to find it, okay, because they're all different. All right, so on, and this is, I think the menu is even different on these newer graphing calculators than the older ones. On these newer ones, like the TI-84C plus CE, the colored ones, if you go to the math menu and you scroll all the way down, I'm going to show you where it is, and now we'll just hit zero. Zero says summation. So if I grab that, it gives me my little sigma and it gives me all the places to fill stuff in. So the sigma on the bottom, I need it to match. So out of focus, sorry. I need it to match what my actual equation looks like. So I'm going to plug a variable in and it doesn't matter what variable I make it. Okay, let's continue that. All right, so. I'm going to use the, the x, t, theta, n, because that's a variable. I'm going to put it in there. It's x. It doesn't matter that it's not i. It's just a variable. Okay? Then the bottom, I have x equals 0, i equals 0, so that's a 0. 
and then I'm gonna arrow over and it's gonna bring me to the top and I'm gonna put three. And then I'm gonna arrow over and it's gonna bring me to the right. Now this has parentheses within the parentheses. So you gotta do those two. So I'll open the parentheses, X, oops, hit the wrong button. Open the parentheses, X plus one, close the parentheses, open the parentheses, X minus two, close the parentheses, hit enter, and there's my summation, okay? It might give it to you, like if you're doing this fraction, realize it might give it to you in decimal. Remember that, that under the math menu, there's also the arrow fraction, the very first one. So you can kind of figure that out, okay? But again, that's math and then zero. That's your summation. I think it looks a little different for the old calculators. I can't even remember. Uh, Janet, did yours look the same? Go, what did it look? Did, when you go to math, is it there? Okay, so let me find it there. 